So I wanted to start by thanking Caitlin and Creative Mornings for having me here this morning. It's so nice to see so many new faces. Um, as I said, hopefully you could hear a little bit. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Renegade Opera, an unconventional opera company here in Portland. In 2020, just before the pandemic shut down most of the world of performing arts, um, we got together, two of my fabulous colleagues and I, and planned our first season that was going to happen in 2020, <laughs> and it didn't. But since then, we have produced an online opera, two live operas, two artists in conversation lecture series, two galas, one outdoor trail recital, and countless conversations about how we can better support artists and audiences and communities when producing opera that is accessible, immersive, and relevant to our current world. This morning, I've been asked to share a little bit about myself and about the mission of the work of Renegade Opera, as well as my own experiences as an artist. As I was thinking about what to share with you all, um, I, just trying to think about, you know, who am I to come up here and tell you about what's important in creativity, right? What would be useful to you all and what would be illustrative of my experience? I, um, I had a conversation recently that came to mind. Um, I had just finished a performance and someone came up to me after the performance and asked me when I first decided to be an opera singer. And I thought about it for a minute and I almost started going into my like, well, I started singing when I was this age and I went to this school and got this degree and I won these auditions and I lost these auditions and all this stuff. I realized that for me personally, something I've been working towards is not thinking about when I decided, but thinking that I'm always deciding, right? I get up every day and decide to put effort and energy and creativity into my work. I decide to sit at the piano and practice. I decide to do networking events. I decide to send emails and send in auditions and do all these vulnerable things because I love it. And it is something that keeps me going. And part of keeping deciding to do these things has to do with the sensation of losing yourself in the artistic process, in reverie, right? Um, feeling the flow of the music, the excitement of collaboration, collectively working towards something that you can't quite see yet, rolling with the punches as they come along and eventually getting to some sort of goal and completion feeling is something that really keeps me going. So all that said about choosing every day and not that the important thing is the beginning, the things that I have done and the places I have been have um, shaped who I am today. And I thought I would share a little bit of music with you as well as speaking. Um, and the music that came to mind are a few arias that have been um, instrumental, <laughs> no pun intended, um, in my development. So the first one that came to mind um, is an aria that I actually, this is one of the first arias I remember performing for anyone. I had started singing, voice, singing in voice lessons in high school and I um, wanted to sing this aria that I had no business performing as a 15 year old. This is called the Willow Song from the Ballad of Baby Doe. Um, it was first performed by Beverly Sills, who was 29 at the time and it's very um, forlorn and melancholy and very, you know, stoic and everything. And, um, I was 15, and I really wanted to sing it, and my teacher was game, and I wanted the challenge, so she uh, helped me work on it, and I remember bringing it to an audition at Northwest Children's Theater in downtown Portland as a 15-year-old, and, um, you know, singing it alongside people who were singing campfire songs and Disney medleys, and I have no idea what they thought of a 15-year-old bringing in this aria, um, but it was in English, so it fit the brief, um, and they uh, seemed to look past that ill-advised audition choice, and I spent a lot of my formative years as a young artist in high school and beyond teaching and performing and directing at Northwest Children's Theater. So this is The Willow Song from The Ballad of Baby Doe by Douglas Moore, and I'm going to make a note on my phone so I can be in the right key. Well, the other thing I was going to say is today I'm singing a cappella which is not typical of my performances. Usually I have a piano or a cello or a whole orchestra, um, but it's really typical of my practicing. <laughs> so you're gonna get a little bit of a behind the scenes, like what it feels like to be a collaborative musician by yourself practicing in your room. <laughs> this is the Ballad of Baby Doe, the Willow Song by Douglas Moore.
imagine a 15-year-old bringing that to an, a musical theater audition. Um, of course, it was my phone that was ringing during that. How embarrassing. It's all good. I put myself on Do Not Disturb. Okay, so the second piece I want to share with you holds a special place in my heart as the final aria from a, um, the first major operatic role I was able to perform. I did my bachelor's degree at Willamette University down in Salem, Oregon, and at that time there was an opera, de uh, opera department and they did a full opera every single year with the undergrads, which is really atypical. Um, and they only did musical theater once every four years because the music department and the theater department didn't love to work together. Um, so I had done a lot of musical theater and I'd never really done opera. I'd done voice lessons, singing arias like the one you just heard. Um, and so my teacher was the director of this opera department, um, opera production, and um, she sat me down halfway through my first, you know, first semester, freshman year. I had gone to Willamette thinking maybe I'll, you know, major in finance or pre-law or math or teaching or English, um, but maybe probably not because I would never make any money, music, which is really what I wanted to do, but I thought it wasn't practical. I could just you know, be in a choir and that would be enough. Um, and so I hadn't decided what my major would be and she sat me down and she said, you know, I really think you have what it takes to make some sort of a life in music. And if you major in music, I will cast you as Susanna in Le Nozze di Figaro, your senior year. The Le Nozze di Figaro is The Marriage of Figaro by Mozart. It's one of my absolute favorites. I think it's one of his best works. It's a comic opera, um, and it really should be named Le Nozze di uh, Susanna <laughs> because Susanna is on stage for most of the three-hour opera. She's really, really, really working hard. And so, I, you know, needless to say, I did go ahead and give the music degree a try. <laughs> and so that's how I found myself as a senior in college performing this whole role with an orchestra and costumes and lights and sets and props and makeup and all of these things at 21. Um, and so this is De Vieni Non Tardar from Le Nozze di Figaro by Mozart. This is at the end of the opera and she um, is just really enjoying the beautiful brook, hoping that Figaro will come back to her and stop playing games. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to save one RA for the end, just you know, keep you here so you don't leave. Uh, <laughs> 
So I did a really cliche thing as I was preparing for this talk, which was to Google the definition of reverie, our theme for today. And what I found got me thinking about my own creative journey and my own creative process. I found a couple definitions. One was a fanciful or impractical idea or theory. And another was a state of being pleasantly lost in one's thoughts. These both almost perfectly depict what, I, what it can be like to create an immersive opera, which is something I spend a lot of time doing. Uh, my favorite part of the creative process is the no bad ideas stage, the stage where I get together with the Renegade team and we just spitball. We throw out ideas, we get lost down rabbit holes, we riff off of one, another, one another's thoughts and eventually find some amazing things. This process of no bad ideas generation and artistic reverie also gets at the core of my own sense of artistic accomplishment and what, it ha what has been a key to creative fulfillment for me so far. When I was going through the process of getting my degrees in school, all, I had so many folks telling me that there was a true path to operatic success, to artistic success. I'm sure many of you guys have the same experience. There's one path that is the most pure and perfect and if you do something else you haven't quite got it right it's not quite as good or as you know somebody else has to choose you to make sure that you're really legit doing this um, and I was lucky to have teachers mentors and colleagues who continually pushed back on that idea um, nevertheless it was there I've worked really hard to de redefine success for myself and for my path one of the hardest things about a performing career, or the career in the arts in general, is the near constant rejection that we all face. Auditioning, networking, applying for things, receiving feedback. It's so easy to feel helpless when you're trying to figure out what the director or the auditor or the audience wants to hear and to see and to lose yourself as the artist. Um, you're gonna hear a lot of no's, a lot of not this times and Worst of all, sometimes you might not hear anything at all until you see the cast list on social media and realize you're not on it. Um, so that feeling of helplessness and wanting to make my own art and wanting to have my own say in what I get to do um, is what actually started my career as a producer and an arts administrator. I wanna pause and give you a little background into the world of opera, which is probably really similar to the world of many art, other art forms. Often as a young artist coming up from school, you end up needing to put things on your resume, right? You want to get some things on there so people think that you can see what you've done. And the, the best way to do that for young artists is to do what's called a pay to sing, which is a really wonderful program where you get to perform an opera role with professionals in the opera world. They give you master classes, voice lessons, all sorts of wonderful training and networking. But the catch is it costs money, it's a training program. So you pay tuition for the uh, honor of being able to perform an opera that is then t tickets are sold and the you know there's money being made somewhere um, but you aren't making that money uh, and so that is a really hard thing for artists who need to make money in their summers between you know the two years of your master's degree and um, some of my colleagues from the master's degree that I was in at the Longy School of Music and I had decided we were going to audition for one of these pay to sings that would cost us three thousand dollars each to go to um, and we had auditioned. Again, this is another thing. You have to audition for these programs and they may not even accept you, right? So you're preparing and you're budgeting and then you audition and you hope that you might be able to pay them money to let you sing. Um, and again, they're really wonderful networking opportunities. It's just the way that this opera world works right now, which is something that Renegade Opera is trying to circumvent. Um, but yeah, so we had decided we were auditioned. We had auditioned, we were waiting to hear back and we were like, what if we don't get in? We already had planned to spend $3,000 each anyway. Why not just use that money to make our own opera? So we created this idea that would be, um, it was in Cambridge, Massachusetts in 2017, and we were tired of waiting and we just decided to go for it. We weren't gonna pay ourselves anything other than like a you know, profit share from many ticket sales we received. And we had other friends in our program and across the city that were also in the same boat of like, mm, I don't know if we're gonna get in and we have this money saved up and let's see what happens. Um, we, not only was this project gonna feature and value emerging artists, but our goal was to make the show immersive, allowing the audience to be up close with the music as it was happening, moving through our unconventional venue with the actors and becoming part of the action of the opera. That first show with that group was a huge success. We even did get a little bit of profit share from it, uh, which was great. 
Um, and we also got into that other program and went to that too. <laughs> so it was a busy summer. Um, but yeah, so then I moved back to Portland and wanted to continue doing that type of work here in town. So I met, um, this is sort of the beginning of Renegade Opera. I met Danielle Jagelski at another pay to sing program called the Aqualon Music Festival. She was the um, associate conductor there at that time. And I asked her to coffee to pitch the idea of Renegade Opera, a company that would focus on the voices of emerging artists, paying them for their time and energy, and creating immersive operas that meet the audiences where they are at. Danielle was excited about the idea, even when I told her that we'd be volunteering our time for the administrative portions of things. Um, and we brought on Elliot Menard as a third member of the team. And we got to work, you know, creating our mission statement and our website and our logo. My husband's a graphic designer, so that helped a lot. Um, <laughs> and we just got to work. In the years since then, we have added a couple of wonderful artists to our team. Abby Crossan and Claire Robertson-Price are also on our team. Um, and we have a creative company, which is sort of an auxiliary creative group that helps with the creative side of things, so not as much administrative. Those folks are Maddie Tran, Jesse Price, and Joellen Sweeney, all fabulous artists here in town. Um, we also now have a board of our own. We've spent a couple years being fiscally sponsored by another organization, and we are now officially our own 501c3 as of August of last year, which is really exciting. Yay. Um, yay, paperwork. Uh, <laughs> no, it's really wonderful. And we've planned our most ambitious season this year in 2023. So the mission of Renegade Opera I'll just tell you briefly, is to promote institutional reform in the performing arts community through the creation of accessible and immersive opera. We support local artists and center traditionally underrepresented voices through ethical producing practices in our operas, and we curate a collective space for creation and discussion of opera's impact in Portland and beyond. It's a long, <laughs> it's a long one, we're actually working on making it more digestible right now, but I'll go into exactly what that means for us. Um, we promote institutional reform by utilizing a lateral leadership structure, so everybody on the team is, their ideas are equally presented and equally considered, right? So much, uh, so often in the world of performance, it's really fast paced, somebody's in charge and they just make a decision and you're a cog in the, we in the machine, you know. Often as an opera singer, you have two weeks of rehearsal, you get plugged in, and then you perform, and you perform four times, and then you leave, right? And that's how opera so often works. Um, and in our, our version of opera, we want it to be as authentic to our performers and our creators as possible. So making sure that everyone's ideas are considered takes a little bit longer, but creates hopefully a much more in, immersive um, and much more diverse story that sort of brings everyone's ideas to the fore. We make our operas accessible with a sliding scale ticket structure. So we have um, all of our main stage shows are $20, $40, or $80. And you get the exact same experience whether you paid $20 or $80. It's an immersive opera, right? Sit wherever you want. We're going to move after you've sat, so don't get too comfortable. Um, so that our hope there is you know, typically in a theater or an opera house the people who paid the most money sit up front and get the best view, and the people who can't pay the most money stand up in the back. I don't know if anyone's ever been to the Metropolitan Opera in New York and sat and like stood up for an entire three-hour opera. I have. Um, it was only $20, but it, my feet hurt after, and I could only see half of the stage because I was so far back. Um, so the, the goal of that sliding scale ticket structure is to make sure everyone feels equally welcome in our productions. Um, knowing that for some people $80 is totally easy for an opera, and for some people $20 is really a stretch. Um, so that's that part of our accessibility. We also have performances in all different locations in the city, so we try to be as movable as possible. We've been in deep southeast, we've been in northeast, we've been um, downtown, and we continue to try and be in different corners of the city so that if you're walking by as we're rehearsing in your own neighborhood, you might find us and be interested. Um, we also offer all of our productions that we're able to videos for free on YouTube. So that's another thing. If you can't come because you have work that night or you can't swing $20 this week, um, you can always see our shows online after the fact. So we also offer paid performance opportunities for emerging artists and center stories of women and queer folks in everything that we do. Um, 
The other thing that's really wonderful about opera is that it's a unique art form that brings in so many different types of artists, right? We have set designers, we have costume designers, we have musicians, we have singers, we have actors, we have directors, we have intimacy directors, and they're all creating one story. So it's really fun to be able to work in a big team like that. And the last thing that I'll say about mission-driven programming is we have a lecture series called Artists in Conversation, which brings emerging scholars in various fields together to offer a platform for sharing new information and ideas. Um, last two years, we've been doing that on Zoom. So those Zoom videos are available on our YouTube channel. Um, and we're excited to be offering some things in person this fall in November. Um, so our vision for the future is an opera community where ideas, strategies, and resources are shared for the betterment of the art form and the community, where the stories we tell on operatic stages are relevant to our current world and offer a fresh perspective, and where everyone feels welcome and that they belong. That's the, the goal of Renegade in a nutshell. And I wanted to share a few things about our past productions to give you an idea about what we've done before. And if I can get you to move our slide over here. <laughs> oh, that's me. One more. Yeah, great. Okay, so this is um, Orfeo in Underland. Um, this was in 2021, and folks were just barely getting back to live performance after vaccines had been made available. Um, if you're familiar with the story of Orpheus and Eurydice, Orpheus goes to the underworld, tries to bring back Eurydice, he can't look at her, et cetera, et cetera. This is the opera version of that. Um, our goal was to create an opportunity for collective grieving and processing that was so palpable in our community at that time. We had lost so much. And so we set this opera, which is about grieving and yearning for you know, connection, at the funeral of Eurydice. So everyone was invited in their ticket email to wear black or whatever you would wear to a funeral, right? And it started with the funeral procession and the opera expanded from there. Um, Another really fun thing that we have been able to do is playing with the gender identity of our characters. So Orf Orfeo, Orpheus, typically is what's called a pants roll in opera. It's a mezzo-soprano that is um, dressed, costumed to be a masculine character. And we wanted to match Orfeo's gender identity to the gender identity of the person performing that role, which meant that Orfeo was a woman and therefore we had a lesbian relationship in our opera, which is really still very atypical in the world of opera. Um, and you know, love is love. So it was just wonderful and it allowed that person to feel like they were being authentically themselves in the character as much as possible. Um, we staged the production to happen all around the audience while the sun set in the garden and created a world of larger than life puppets that so you can see the big giant puppet that's like a 12 foot tall puppet um, and some cool masks for our furies in the underworld. Um, and we really wanted that to, we, you know, we titled it, titled it Orfeo in Underland, like Alice in Wonderland, kind of falling down the rabbit hole with these giant larger than life puppets. Um, so yeah, that's Orfeo. Let's go to the next one. Great. So now we were able to do an indoor opera, yay! Um, after Orfeo, we decided it was finally time to produce the long-awaited Mozart adaptation, which had been the first show we had hoped to do when we first had auditions. I think the Renegade Opera auditions were like the last thing I did, March whatever, 19th, 17th, anyway, we don't need to think back to that time. But it was literally like that day and then everything stopped. And we had planned to do Tito, which is a, um, modern adaptation of Mozart's La Clemenza di Tito, which is a political show. And we set it in kind of a dystopian parallel universe United States where the president was more like a dictator and the audience arrived and was the press. So you got a press lanyard and you got, some folks got like a little notebook and they were actually invited to speak some lines during the show. There was like a press conference and we like stood them up and they said their thing. It was super fun. Um, and actually at intermission, they were invited, everyone in the audience had to write a um, headline that they were gonna you know, publish with their, you know, their publication. And depending on which headline they chose, we changed the end of the opera. So we had two different endings that were planned and based on, you know, we had three headlines that were like this and three headlines that were like this and whichever one picked which one was most picked decided what happened in the end of the opera. So as a performer, it was really exciting. Um, and as an audience member, it was maybe a little bit disconcerting or confusing or, you know, like, what? What do you mean? 
How is it going to change? Um, but yeah, so that was um, Tito, and we had a really lovely time. This was at Historic Alberta House in Northeast Portland. And again, we had an all-femme cast, and we reworked this show that's typically mostly male characters, two different pants roles in this show, um, for treble-voiced people and for female-presenting people. So we had a whole female cast of politicians. The president was a, was a woman and all of this stuff. So it was a really fun um, exploration of a pretty apt story about political intrigue and power struggle and how all those things interconnect. Okay. Okay, and this is our most recent show. This was just a few weeks ago out at Leech Botanical Garden. We did a show called Bird Songs of Opera, and it is a trail walking recital. So the audience was invited to Leech Botanical Garden, which is a beautiful space. If you've never been there, go check it out. It's on like 122nd and Foster in Southeast Portland. And so our costume designer, Kelly McDonough, created over-the-top costumes for our six local Northwest birds. So we picked six birds, and we paired them with six of the most famous opera arias that are most beloved, that sort of matched the personalities of these birds. And we had them all accompanied by our bird watcher, who was also an accordionist. So they walked the audience around with their accordion, and we came upon a bird, and they had a little sort of conversation with their bird call, and the accordionist would start to play, and there was a scene, and then that bird would be like, go away. And then that you'd find another bird down the path a little ways, and it was such a fun experience. Um, and we still have all the costumes. So if you want a bird show to come to your space, you just let me know. Um, yeah, so that's Bird Songs of Opera. We had such a fun time doing that show. It was pretty hot, but you know, you, it, better than raining is what I've said. So, yeah. Also, just to say out loud, all these photos that you've seen are by um, Tom Lupton, who's a fabulous photographer here in town. Um, yeah, so those are some of the past projects. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and here are some future projects. Yeah. In September, we're producing Adam's Run, which is a new operatic dark comedy by American composer Ruby Fulton and librettist Baynard Woods, both living American composers and composer and librettist. Um, it's set in the near future America in the throes of climate collapse. Existentialist weather woman Julie Shore and environmentalist evangelist Reverend Billy Noble vie for America's viewership on their primetime television shows. Despite ideological differences, they choose to work together as part of this story, but not without retaliation from Billy's fervent followers. Television producer Dana Daring tells their story as a series of flashbacks. So this is a brand new opera. It was produced as a, a video opera in 2017, actually pre-pandemic video opera. Um, and it's never been performed on stage before. So we're in Zoom conversations with Ruby and Baynard about like, okay, well, you did this for the video. Could we do this for the, you know, the stage performance? This is our first time doing a brand new opera. We've done a lot of, as you've seen, adaptations of older works. And this is our first time working with a living composer, right? Mozart and Gluck are not living. Um, <laughs> quite a long time ago. Um, yeah, so that is our, our main stage production for this year. It'll happen in September at Shaking the Tree Theater in Southeast Portland. In November, we'll be evolving our Artists in Conversation lecture series into a kind of performance and lecture series mix. So we have, um, let's see, He Loves You Back or Climate Collaboration Dramas. This is a, a kind of mix of new works all centering around climate um, and thinking about the world as a feminine body and what that does to our ability to, or uh, how that allows us to exploit the world if we think of her as female. So thinking about women and reproductive rights and the, and the planet as a, a whole idea to put those together. Um, and then the other thing that will be happening during that festival is American Patriots. And Sam, um, Sam who is the creator of this, um, American Patriots, put together a lecture for us in our Artists in Conversation series last season, and then we asked her to bring the show to us, because she had just commissioned this work. And the um, American Patriots is a song cycle she commis commissioned during the pandemic that puts together um, interview questions. She got together and interviewed 10 different folks from each of these three different um, sort of demographics, African Americans, Native Americans, and low-income white Americans. 
and she asked them all the same questions, and then she took some of those answers, created poetry for them, and then sent them to composers who identified as those demographics. Um, and those composers wrote, wrote songs based on, with that language and based on those answers. And it's put together in a song cycle. And the way the festival will work is that we'll have sort of a festival ticket where on a Saturday it'll be, you know, She Loves You Back, and then American Patriots, and on the Sunday it'll be American Patriots, and then She Loves You Back, and if you buy the festival ticket, you can come for a whole day, go, it's at Alberta House in Northeast Portland, go to the food carts between, get dinner, come back, get a drink at the bar, and then watch the next show. Or you can, of course, come to just one or the other, or two on different days. I don't know, we haven't figured out exactly how it's all gonna work, but. That'll be, that's for a later No Bad Ideas session. <laughs> um, so that's kind of what we've been up to. If you want to know more about us, there's, um, there's some cards in the back. There's also a QR code. You can join our mailing list on our website. You can follow us on Instagram, Renegade Opera PDX. Um, and yeah, it's been really thrilling to create stories with uh, this community and colleagues at Renegade Opera. Um, we're looking forward to continuing this work. We're really fortunate to have the support of the Portland community through grants, individual donations, and audiences. Um, so if you'd like to learn more and support us, we'd really, really appreciate that. Um, and we look forward to seeing you at one of our shows. So then alongside my work as a director, producer, and performer with Renegade Opera, I have also been individually performing and auditioning and you know studying and all that stuff. Um, and the last piece I wanted to share with you today actually comes from those experiences. Um, I was really lucky and fortunate to be cast in a show at Portland Opera this past spring. Uh, it was my first time singing in a union house. I've done a lot of operas, but never at a um, not, never as a soloist in a union house. I sing with the Portland Opera Chorus quite often, which is such a fun experience. And it was really cool to sign a contract that says, you know, we need you for this whole month and we don't know when your rehearsal will be, so you can't do anything else because we're gonna email you the night before and it might be 10 a.m. or it n might not be called or whatever, right? So it's like this whole month contract where I was just like, okay, I'm yours, do with me what you want. Um, and so that was a really cool experience. The opera is called Rusalka. It's the Czech language version of The Little Mermaid um, by Antonin Dvorak. And I was a wood sprite. So there's this wood sprite trio that essentially is like the comic relief in what, what otherwise is a pretty dark story of like yearning for something that's out of reach and realizing that it really wasn't what you thought it would be. Um, so the wood sprites come in at this really dark part in the opera and are like, la, 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 look how cool we are. You know, it's just very, it was very fun to be in that position rather than like dying on stage. Um, so part of that production was also we got invited, the three of us Wood Sprites got invited to do these opera previews out in the community. And actually one of them was down in Salem. So some, some of my Willamette folks were able to come to that. Um, and they asked us to do some of the Wood Sprite music, but also some of the more famous arias and things from the opera. And they asked me to do Rusalka's most famous aria, the Song to the Moon. And without the orchestra, you might not really recognize it, but I think by the end, you'll kind of, you'll, many people have heard this aria. It's kind of one of those ones where if they want it to sound fancy on a commercial, they'll play this in the background, you know? Um, so yeah, so this is the Song to the Moon from Rusalka. Um, Rusalka, the, wood, the water nymph, is asking the moon to watch over her beloved prince until she can be there with him. Right after this, we meet Yeji Baba, the sea witch, and um, I was gonna say Ariel, but Rusalka becomes um, human and goes up and tries exploring something new. Um, this is her moment of kind of quiet reflection and wondering, am I going to risk it, right? Do I really want this bad enough to go beyond what I've known and try for something new? This is Song to the Moon from Rusalka by Dvorak. I'm gonna hold my music, because it's in Czech. Um, and I, I know it, but I don't know it that well, you know.
Thank you. Okay, I think that's basically all I have. Oh, I had just one little anecdote for you left. Um, thank you for bearing with me. How are we doing on time? Little, um, time for one more little tidbit? Okay. So I just didn't want, I wanted to leave you with something to think about in the theme of reverie. Um, and one of the things that came to mind is um, a story that I like to tell my students. So I teach piano and voice lessons when my schedule allows. And um, when I was little, something I love to tell my struggling piano students, when I was little, I took piano because I was forced to and I was required to practice and I absolutely hated it. It was a chore, it was not anything I wanted to do. I didn't like the music I was playing. I, was, I always felt like I didn't do enough in my lessons. I always felt like I was never gonna do enough, so why even try? And um, so I quit which was really exciting. Um, my parents let me quit, which was cool. And uh, then in middle school and high school, I got really into choir and musical theater and I found myself sitting at the piano trying to figure out how to practice my notes. Because as a singer, you don't, you know, it's not like a clarinet where you have fingerings. You have to figure out what the notes are to get them in your brain so that your voice will do it. Um, and so then I found myself teaching myself piano essentially, right? Sitting there and kind of remember the little bits that I had tried not to learn <laughs> back in elementary school. And so then I went to a teacher in high school and got some piano lessons. And what I so appreciated about him was that I brought him specific songs and was like, I would like to learn this. And the first time I did that, I was like, ooh, this is not gonna go well. He's gonna say no, I'm gonna have to like learn Furlis again. Um, and I, you know, that's fine, I love Furlis, it's great. If you love Furlis, that's wonderful. It just wasn't for me at that time. And, um, and he was totally game. He was like, yeah, of course, let's do it. Like, we should probably learn some scales and do another thing just for your technique, but like, let's learn that song that you want to learn. Um, so always with my students, I ask them what they want to play, right? And, and if they start a song and they figure out they actually don't want to work on it, we can leave it, you know, and maybe come back to it, but maybe just leave it. And then, you know, if I have a student who continually leaves a song, I will invite them to finish it before we move on. But, um, but most of the time, I'm like, yeah, let's, you know, let's find something new that feels exciting. And that goes back to that question of reverie, right? What makes you excited to do your work? What gets you up in the morning? What gets you excited about making your art and doing the things that you want to do? And following that, following those impulses, allowing my brain to take like a seven minute break from whatever I'm doing and come back to it um, has made me a much happier artist. So that's what I wanted to leave you all with today. And thank you very much for your time. Thanks. We have time for a few questions. But first, I want to ask, who's been to an opera before? Show of hands. OK, we have a decent number of opera. Those of you who are not raising hands yet, do you want to go to an opera now? Every hand, every hand. OK, <laughs> wonderful. OK, we have a few questions. Yeah. Time for a few questions. And um, just please remember to repeat them. Question. Great. 
great. The question is, what, what's the difference between musical theater and opera, and what made me pivot? Um, it's a really good question. It's, I often kind of equate it to the difference between violin and fiddle, where like the instrument is the same, the music can be the same, and the style with which you sing is slightly different. So um, one of the huge differences between musical theater and opera is that in musical theater, you have a microphone on you all the time, and the music is um, amplified. The band is amplified, the singers are amplified, all of that has a microphone. With opera, you are not amplified. So you're singing in the Keller Auditorium, just bare voice to the back of the hall. Um, and that changes what the technique needs to be, right? There was a, there's a lot of there's what's called overtones in the singing voice that if you open the, we can get really technical if you want, but if you open your resonating space in your voice, you can achieve these overtones that allow your voice to carry through space and hit a human ear really, really far away with that feeling that you're close up, which is a really cool kind of experience. So that's one of the technical differences is microphones versus not microphones. The storytelling can be really similar. Um, and the, the style of music, classical music versus popular music, is often how you sort of think of the, di the two different ones, opera being classical music, musical theater being more popular music or jazz. Um, but there are some jazz operas. There are musical theater pieces that are much more operatic, like Phantom of the Opera is one that I think of all the time. It's, it technically is a musical because there are spoken scenes in between. Um, and it's amplified. But there's tons of operatic singing in it. Um, and there are operas that have spoken scenes in the middle that are really hard to hear because you're <laughs> not amplified. <laughs> uh, but yeah, great question. What other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Great question. So the question is about how we sort of programmed the new works, right? How do we find out about them? Um, Danielle Jagelski, our music director, um, studied under Ruby Fulton at Idaho, um, University of Idaho, and um, knew about her work and just kind of reached out to Ruby and was like, hey, do you have anything that you'd want us to produce? We also, the theme of the season is loosely about climate justice and the world, and so Adam's Run felt like a really good fit for that. Um, the art songs that are happening in the She Loves You Back production came from Jesse Price, who was our main producer on that show. Um, and they curated basically stuff that they had heard that they really liked, that they thought would work well. They're a, they're a composer as well, so they are in the world of composers in um, the US and in the world. So yeah, that's how we found out. Sort of networking and sort of listening. And yeah, it's harder to know about new works sometimes. Yeah. What other questions? Anything else? Yeah. 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 Totally. So the question is about learning operas in different languages, specifically in Czech and what the process is like of trying to figure out what the words mean that you're saying and, and how to be you know, acting in the story. Um, yeah, I don't speak fluent Italian or French or Czech. Um, I speak some German, so that is helpful. But um, when I'm preparing an opera, uh, you have to translate all the things that you're saying. So you do know exactly what each word that you're singing means. And if my, my rule of thumb is if I'm on stage, I need to know all the words that are being said to me or that I'm saying, right? And if I'm off stage, I'm allowed to just be like, this scene is about this. <laughs> and then I'll come in later and figure it out. Um, and, and then in the rehearsal process, we kind of like get into the real character of things. Um, but yeah, so there is a lot of word to word translation and then also figuring out how to say these sounds. There's a sound in Czech um, that is really difficult to, to do. It's actually in the name Dvorak. It's the rz sound, rz, which is an R with a little squiggle on it. Um, or not a squiggle, a little, little guy. I can show you. It's this R. <laughs> um, so that is a rz. Let's try it. Rz. It's a flipped or like a rolled R with a z sound. Rz all together. So it, there was a lot of practicing of that sound uh, as we were trying to figure out how to get that to come out of our mouth um, 
The other thing about Czech is that it has some words that are without vowels. So there's a, a word that is TRP. That's the word. And you're supposed to sing that on a note. Um, so there's a lot of like, or like, maybe. Uh, that, yeah, everybody does it slightly differently depending on who your Czech coach is in the operatic world. But yeah, so there's a lot of translating, a lot of learning um, what the individual words mean that you're singing and that are being sung to you. But I do not speak these languages fluently. It's just a lot of research. Yeah. What other questions? Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, so the question is about how I built that renegade opera team. I didn't really go into that much because I only had half an hour. Um, but yeah, so we, I came to Portland and I did some market research of like, yeah, I'm from here, I grew up here, and I knew a lot about what was going on in the art scene, but it's different when you go away and, and you were like a, a community member, young person, and you go away and you come back and all of a sudden you're a professional, right? You like are this new version of yourself in this community. And I did some market research of like, okay, what companies already exist? What's going on? Who are my friends that I know are doing this? And nobody else seemed to be wanting to do specifically immersive shows. And that was really what I wanted to do. I feel like that um, takes the art form of opera in a really new, fresh direction. So I um, just sort of brainstormed folks that I really would want to work with. Danielle Jagelski and I met each other at a um, pay to sing program. And um, Elliot Menard, who I mentioned, was also at that program, and she had just recently graduated from Reed um, with a classics degree, and she was really interested in writing, specifically grant writing. So we were like, great, come on, come on down, let's do some grant writing together. Um, and so the three of us started in that pandemic year where we made an online opera. It was the three of us working together, and then through the process of hiring folks and working with other performers, we sort of got a, a vibe from people about who would want to stay on the team and do more work administratively as a volunteer. Um, and that's how we met Claire Robertson Price. We cast her in a show. Um, she was one of the Furies in Orfeo, the pictures that you saw with the masks. And she was just super helpful and really game to be on board. And so we asked her to be part of the team. And she's been like an integral part of our operations. Um, and then Abby Crossan is a friend of mine actually from Boston when I was doing my master's and she moved to Portland and had been doing what's called Opera on Tap. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this organization. It's a national organization that takes opera singers into like bars and pubs. And they do things very similar to what I just did of like just acapella singing in a bar on a Friday night. Like if you happen to be there getting a drink, like you also get some opera, sorry. Um, <laughs> Uh, so she had been one of the, they call themselves managing divas at Opera on Tap. And so she had been doing that in Boston and came to Portland. Um, and I kind of immediately was like, oh my gosh, Abby, I'm doing this thing. Do you want to do this thing with me? And uh, she was really game to join as well. And she's been our kind of marketing and communications um, hub since then. And the team is really, uh, we're all really hands on deck all the time. So we have our little corners that we're most excited about. Again, it's that thing of like, what do you want to do? Especially when you're doing volunteer work and spending so much time and energy doing things. It's so important to be like, I could do that, but actually I will be mad about it after I do it. So could someone else do it that would be happy about it after I do it, right? Um, so we do a lot of those kind of discussions on the team of like, I don't have time for that right now. Who else can help me? Like, I knew, I know I said last week that I was going to do this, and I didn't, and I can't do it this week. So who can, you know, who has time and who has energy and who has, like, creative juice to get that done? Um, and it's continually evolving. We have that creative company I was talking about. Those are also people who have been performers or um, creatives on projects and just wanted to stick around. I do a lot of like, you know, people say, hey, I'm really interested in getting into it. And then we just say, OK, come on and let's see how it, see how it fits. Yeah, that's kind of it. Great. We have, I have um, one over here, but do we not have time? If you need to go, it's cool. I'm going to take one more question. <laughs> Yeah. Hmm.
yeah, the question is about sort of the visual end of opera in the context of like a musical, you know, like a, um, a, an op a concert, excuse me. It wouldn't, wouldn't have very many, you know, sets or costumes or things. Is that kind of what you're talking about? The, the worlds that we create visually in the shows? Yeah, so, so a lot of that work comes from our, direct, our stage directors, our music directors, and, and who they decide to hire for the set design and the costume design. And it's all about sort of building that team and having a vision. Um, we do a lot, especially because we're just so, um, we're, we're very bare bones at this point in our, in our trajectory. We've only been here for three years, you know, it's like very new and we aren't able to pay folks a lot. So most of what we do is like, this is what we're thinking, do whatever seems awesome to you, right? Like we, we hired Kelly to do Bird Songs of Opera, just being like, are you interested in this project? Like, this is our budget. Eh, you know, um, and she got really excited about it and was just really creatively inspired to do those things. So that um, it's really collaborative, I guess, is the, the answer. Um, but it's led by the stage director and the set designer and the costume designer. And they all we have like production meetings before rehearsals begin. So we'll have multiple production meetings, one to sort of discuss the world of the show visually and the story and how those two things move together and the music, of course, those three things. Um, and then come together again and everybody sort of presents their work of like, this is what I think the costume world will be and this is what I think the set world will be and the music stuff has changed in this way or whatever. And then we come together again and we get like specifics. All of that stuff usually happens on Zoom because we're just so busy and things happen. But yeah, so there's a lot of like, can I share my screen on Zoom? <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you all so much. I'll be here. There's cards in the back if you want to learn more. Thank you.